welcome to Pause for Payments. My name is Christy Duncan, and I am absolutely des delighted and excited to have with me Angela Donahoe. Angela is CIO at BPay in Australia, based in Sydney. Welcome, Angela. Thanks so much, Christy. It's delightful to be here. I'm really looking forward to our discussion this morning. Yeah. We're going to talk today about the very cool stuff that you're doing at BPay in building the API developer portal and how that ties into the bigger agenda of open data and Australia's consumer data rights. So let's get started. Angela, can you start us off by telling us about what you do as CIO at BPay? And perhaps for those in our audience who don't know what BPay is, you could tell us about that too. Okay, great. Well, um, BPay is a Bill Payments Organisation was established by the four major Australian banks about 23 years ago. Uh, since that time, BPay has grown to be um, Australians' preferred way to pay bills. And it was originally conceived as a solution that would make it easier for businesses to get paid and to help with uh, their reconciliation of payments and to make it easier for you and I who needed to pay a bill to have the assurance that uh, that payment was going to get to its destination and not get lost in the mail or, or, or get caught up in some sort of difficulty. And um, the, the BPay payments proposition has proved to be a really compelling one. So today in 2021, we have over 60,000 Australian businesses who are registered to receive payments as a BPay biller. And the network that we've created uh, serves more than 100 um, I think it's about 150 financial institutions and other aggregators who offer the BPay services um, to, to their customers. So BPay as an organisation has a business to business business model. And then the organisations who are members of our network, they then offer the customer experience to, to their customers. And so it's proved to be a really, really effective uh, payments mechanism in the Australian environment. And, and we have taken that product and evolved it over the 23 years. So um, in the last 10 years, we brought BPay View to the market. And so that was a way of um, having uh, bills actually delivered to individuals through their banking channels. Mm -hmm. We also developed OSCO, a real-time payment solution, which is offered over our uh, the Australian new payments platform. And that went live uh, about two and a half years ago. And so we've had a history of innovation and adapting our solutions to become more accessible, to meet the needs of markets, and to really provide uh, valued services to the financial services community that we serve. It sounds like a very collaborative approach to offering these fantastic services through your major banks in Australia, but then to a fantastic, you know, wide audience of consumers across the country. So I think that's one of the things that does distinguish BPay because, um, you know, we, we have an environment, as many countries do, where there's a desire to ensure that there's um, a competitive landscape and there's access to services. And so we've worked really hard to make sure that our governance frameworks aid that, that um, desire. And so we have management committees and, and we have competitors who sit around the table that come together in a collaborative way to agree on the fundamentals of this payments solution and help that evolve. And, uh, and we've been progressively increasing access to that environment. Um, and, and so that's something that's been well received by fintechs and startups who perhaps initially may not see the relevance of BPay in terms of their business proposition, but as they listen to their customers and they start to mature their services, they actually see there's a lot of value served by actually including BPay as part of the services they offer their audiences. Very cool. So you've got this amazing platform that you've evolved over the last 23 years and you've built in OSCO and, and other things. Tell me about this uh, new thing that you're doing, this, this um, API developer portal. Okay. As part of our commitment to innovation and in my role at BPay, I'm the chief information officer. So 
I'm responsible for the um, effective operations of our services and over half of the people that work at BPAY are actually involved in a technology role because uh, it's technology that um, enables our services. And um, as we looked to what the market needed and we started having, as we saw the strengthening fintech marketplace in Australia and also we see that um, our long-standing customers were starting to look at generational changes of their back-end systems, the conversation started emerging as to whether there were easier ways of actually connecting into BPAY for transaction purposes. Because our traditional ways of integrating were quite heavy duty and they needed um, quite a lot of investment and integration. And, and we saw, saw that there was a demand and an interest in APIs. So we started looking at how that would fit with our, our business proposition. So we created a project internally and it was, um, it was led by, it was, it was a joint effort between um, our business product people and, and our technologists. And um, two of our talented people spent a lot of time actually researching and understanding the technology landscape. Our product people had a lot of conversations with current and prospective customers. And we really felt that there was value to be served by um, looking at how APIs and offering that could be an alternative way of connecting into BPAY services. As it turned out, and, and it's often the case with technology, you really need to have some vision because we, you get it right when you look ahead two or three or five years to see what's emerging and you start to think about the foundations and getting some experience. Um, when, you, when you do that and you're ready, then th really great things can happen. And as it turned out in BPAY, um, our, our technology teams had developed some API, basically the, the foundations of APIs that we we're using internally between our systems. And when the conversation emerged about the opportunities with APIs, we started to look at what we already had and we found we had some good starting places to, um, to, to build on. What also provoked this, um, BPAY was really challenged by our board to, I joined BPAY uh, four and a half years ago and I came in at a time when the board was really looking to see what was our next drive for innovation. And we had an opportunity to see how we could work with accounting packages to increase the ability to create batches of payments that could be easily transferred between accounting packages and the BPAY um, ecosystem to help with adoption and, and meet a need there. And so we developed something called Batchmaker. And Batchmaker was our first foray into um, human-centered design, it was our first foray actually in, in looking to build something that was going to be used by a wide consumer base because our history was actually B2B services. So we're very good at that back end, but we hadn't had a lot of experience in consumer-facing solutions. And so it was quite exciting for us. We undertook um, quite a widespread program within BPAY and we worked with external consultants. We learned all about human-centered design. We'd already been committed to agile development practices, but it really acted as a spur to really bring product and technology teams together. And we built something that we call Batchmaker. And so that was offered through one of the accounting package stores. And it was a great experience for us because it really made us question about how we did create more of a streamlined end-to-end ability to connect into the BPAY ecosystem. And we started to see that APIs were needed for that to become a reality. And so as we saw that that was needed and we looked at what we had, we did have these foundations of APIs already built and we're able to take those and build on those and start to expose our first APIs to support um, our Batchmaker product. So that was the start of the journey. And as we, we saw that and we were speaking to some of our other longstanding customers who are looking at um, the next iterations of their internet banking solutions for their customer base, they didn't really want to build some of the legacy integrations that were there and repeat that. So they were asking us about APIs. So that started our journey. Um, we launched our first APIs. In fact, I can check on the dates. I'll come back to you on that. And we, we started with three APIs and it didn't actually take us that long to get those to market. And, and we did it in a way where we leveraged existing technologies, we uh, leveraged our existing hosting platforms, and that was a great way to get started and speak to the market about what we had available. 
But we realised that wasn't enough, so we created a project to step that up. And so um, our project was led, as I said before, by a product person working with a senior technology person. We did a proof of concept. We, we picked some technology that gave us the flexibility and, and which really enabled the design and, and the offering of our developer platform. That also coincided with our increased appetite to use public cloud services. So I say that BPAY, we're unapologetically conservative. We work in the business of needing to be trusted. We have very high service standards. We have a very, um, our, our services are very visible if they get interrupted. And so we have always been interested in evolving our technologies, but with some caution and care to make sure that we um, have our customers and our service commitments at the forefront of all of our decisions. But with the APIs, we started to see that um, by using more public cloud services, we could actually start to achieve higher service availability. We could have more flexibility and be able to scale up or scale down as, as demand required. And it was a great, um, certainly the technologists in our organisation were very excited to be playing with new technology and, and seeing what it could do for us. Uh, so we developed our API developer portal and that's in production today. And we have, we are starting to find that the, there's a lot of interest for um, people to experiment with that platform. So as part of setting up a developer platform, it's not just about the technology and, and a website that you can go to. It's actually about a whole process of offering areas to experiment. So in our sand pits or our sandboxes, and then to, uh, with interest, progress to easy adoption in a production sense. And that required a bit of a shift of thinking within BPAY about, well, how would we do that? Is, is that safe? Um, how do we make it self-service? Uh, how do we actually develop the content? Who is our audience? Because with a developer portal, it's primarily developers who are using that. But the decision makers about whether you want an API will often be on the business side. So we had to come to an understanding about who are our audience, what would they like to see? What creates a frictionless, easy experience? But by the same token, there need to be approval mechanisms. We need to make sure that um, risks around that are managed and, and it sort of fits into our business frameworks and our, our service frameworks and our contracting frameworks. So it's been a really fascinating process for us. And I've got to say, it's been a resounding success for BPAY. Wow. Oh. Congratulations. Well, I have to say, it's no wonder that you've recently been recognized as one of Australia's top 50 senior technology and digital executives. Congratulations on that. But this, this work really is so groundbreaking and it's so innovative and you're just at the leading edge. Sometimes I call it the bleeding edge of technology in our industry. And it's really, really exciting. Angela, congratulations. Thank you. I wonder if you could give us some examples. This is, you know, you're building lots of, of infrastructure here for the industry to tap into. Can you give us some examples of some of these new um, products or services that some of these new API users might be offering? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, I think in our earlier conversation, we are talking about some of the Australian landscape and certainly we do have a very active environment and a very vibrant fintech and reg tech community. So we, we are seeing in our, in our areas here, a lot of innovation around uh, consumer payment solutions. And, it, and when we see that some of that innovation is not so much about building new backend ways of, of processing, but it's actually having an easier way of accessing those services through great apps or um, taking some friction out. So um, using smart AI, machine learning, uh, aggregating data that actually delivers some convenience or some differentiation to, to audiences that, that makes sense. And so that's some of what we're seeing with the FinTechs. They, they deliver something that may not be in our core products, but without our core products, their solution really doesn't have much to offer an audience. Um, we are finding, I mean, I really can't sort of mention some of them because they're, they're discussions underway, but um, okay. 
But yeah, there's an no, interest in experimentation and we get probably new inquiries every week wanting to know more about BPAY. Uh, we're seeing in the Australian fintech landscape and, and really the financial services landscape, really quite an interesting web behind the scenes of, of businesses who are starting to forge connections and um, so, so different pathways. And in the headlines this week, we've seen one of the major banks announced an acquisition of one of the neo banks that, that started a couple of years ago. We uh, are seeing... And which one was that? Zinja? Uh, 86400 is being okay. acquired by NAB, NAB's Ubank arm. And part of uh, you know, what the headlines are saying, part of the attraction is the, the great technology platforms that 86400 has established. So that, okay. that's interesting. And you know, 86400 are a customer of BPAY as is NAB. So that, that's interesting for us. Mm -hmm. well, like to be challenged and as I say every week we have organizations coming to us looking to have conversations because part of what they see is um, some, some core infrastructure and connections and and uh, knowledge that BPAY can bring to the table but also our relationships with the financial services community you know we we have fully cultivated uh, effective ways of working. We're, we're respectful and understand there's a lot of uh, competing interests within the, the banking community and, and in terms of products and, and choices that are made. And so we have really, I think, developed a reputation for listening, a reputation for being able to coordinate complex change in a complex and um, ever-changing environment. But we're also selective about what we do because um, we, there are lots of opportunities, but we have to be careful about the ones that we invest our time and effort in. And we're also very protective of the BPAY brand. We have one of the most recognised brands in the Australian uh, marketplace in financial services. And it's something that we are very careful about because we want to make sure that anything that we undertake, it's, um, it's aligned with our brand commitments and our brand propositions. Well, that makes a lot of imminent sense. Sounds like you've become the masters of collaboration and finding value in this market. Well, we, well, we think we, we have become very competent in that space. Of course, we're not the only ones, so there is choice, but we'd like to be consider ourselves to be one of the preferred ones. Indeed, indeed. I'd like to take this conversation a little bit beyond BPAY and financial services because Australia's approach to the whole concept of open banking, <clears throat> excuse me, is taking the, the open concept beyond banking to uh, this whole consumer data right and the API economy that, um, you know, Australia is taking a really holistic approach to this open data concept, uh, transcending financial services to incorporate telecom as well as utility data. And you'll probably tell me even more. Can you tell us a little bit more about the principles that Australia is following and how you see that consumer data right actually um, playing out in the market? Well, first I'm going to say I'm personally not an expert on consumer data rights, so I'll offer you some opinions. And it's it's not an area that BPAY is immersed in, and so, but nonetheless, it touches on what we are what we are doing. So it's a really vibrant area and it's one of great interest and, and opportunity. Uh, so the consumer data rights is, uh, is, is evolving, as you've touched on. It started with financial services and um, being a, uh, yeah, with various stages of information access and, and interactions that are envisaged by that. Um, as I understand it, it's now the focus is in the telecommunications area. Uh, and, and part of this is actually trying to create more open access to data for individuals to help, um, to help them with understanding service choices and prospective service providers to be able to access that data and offer much more tailored solutions, all mm -hmm. under a mature consent model. And that's really integral to this. And you know, it's, it's quite interesting because I think um, the attitudes of Australians towards data and privacy, et cetera, I think we are quite an aware country. You know, we, we, we 
we can be quite skeptical about motives and things at times. But we also are acknowledged as a country of having a very um, hearty appetite for innovation, technology adoption, et cetera. And if individuals can see that there's potential benefits associated with information access and sharing, then they'll probably have a, a greater propensity to, to agree to, um, to that data management. It has been quite a, a difficult process to implement um, the, the services that support um, consumer data right compliance and, and things. And I know certainly our, our banking colleagues have been very consumed with, with readying for CDR compliance and, and the, the um, further stages that are planned. But from what I understand, they're also seeing a lot of opportunity in that space now. And um, I'm aware at least one, one bank, one, one large bank has applied to be a recipient under the CDR. And so that means they intend to be able to access this data themselves and, and bring that into some sort of service proposition for their customers. So that's really, really interesting because, you know, you've got um, the market where, okay, we have to, that information is available it can be used, but we also have to have a market that starts to understand that opportunity and starts to use that. So how does that turn into good? And there's certainly an information, there's a movement data for good, which I think is sort of interesting in, in this context, because the fact that data is available, um, there really needs to be a regulatory environment and, and support structure that makes sure that is, that is utilised for beneficial and um, well-intentioned purposes, not otherwise. And so the regulatory regime around this is, is been a very big focus in the Australian market. Moving into telecommunications, I think similar motives, which is about, you know, where telecommunications is such a big part of all of our lives now. Um, with my mother in hospital uh, this week, there isn't a phone in, near her hospital bed. And, you know, she's 86, and fortunately can use a mobile phone. And without that, we wouldn't be able to contact her. So we just start to think about the role of telecommunications in our lives is becoming much, much larger. So the personal context and the business context, and certainly the spend at a household level and a business level continues to, to rise uh, as we have growing dependence on telecommunications. So we can see there's a lot of opportunity there, but, but it's costly to implement. It has to be regulated. And there also has to be trust and confidence by consumers in business in, in terms of that information provision and, and those motives. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, certainly, I know in the financial services sector, the next stage is actually looking at the ability not just to call on, on data, but actually ability to write data back. So that becomes a much more complicated as well. So once again, I'm not an expert in this space, but I do find it interesting. If I do sort of, uh, I have a personal interest in this. I used to work, um, for a state government in Australia. And so government's interest in sharing data has been long standing. And I used to work for a large agency where we actually had to provide data. It was available through um, open portals, through APIs. And it was quite interesting because the nature of that data, um, one, sometimes you wondered just how useful it was, but other times it could be incredibly useful. And we've had some amazing success stories in Australia, most notably, with um, transport apps. So for public transport, if you want to know if the trains are running on time or when the next bus is due or the optimal route to get from your house to your destination, there's just some amazing apps and they're all being fueled by the open data that's been offered through government uh, that's drawn upon to provide the sources of data for those applications. And I think it's a really wonderful success story about how data can be used for good and it's probably the types of things that we should look for with CDR to see, well, how can um, open data be used in beneficial ways for the community? Yeah, no, those are really interesting insights, Angela. Thank you. Um, I am certain you'll have some, some thoughts on my next question, which goes to the whole cybersecurity issue. And, you know, as a result of, of the pandemic in the last year, we've moved so many of our transactions online and virtual and mobile and and uh, there's this corresponding increase in cyber crime how do you how do you manage that what what advice would you have for the the bankers in our audience or the the um, people trying to manage this crime from the uh, prevention side 
My advice is take it seriously. You know, some people feel that security is a nuisance, that uh, it's, it's, it's problematic because it can disrupt confidence, it takes money to do it well, and, and you can't just do it and forget about it. It's something you have to be constantly reviewing and seeing whether the approach is being taken to understand the risks, to monitor um, the risks that you're experiencing, to, to prevent those, et cetera, as a whole framework, that it's appropriate. And certainly in the Australian landscape, cybersecurity is a board responsibility. It starts at the top. And so it's something I think everybody has to be conscious of. Even in your personal life, I don't know about you, but um, I've experienced a compromised credit card recently and, um, and you're starting to see things using your phone that we, we, we're increasingly getting prompted by the services that we use to change our passwords and more, use more complex passwords. And that's because uh, it's a real industry, organised crime, um, hackers who are just mischievous, find it a great delight to try and penetrate the defences that organisations and individuals have set up for themselves. And of course, the cost of fraud for, for banks, for, for governments, for, for people is enormous and it's growing. So cybersecurity should be something we are all interested in. Um, it's, it's something that we have to understand as a trade-off between convenience and doing it well. So it's things like complex passwords. I changed my own password on my phone last night. And of course, it's a nice complex one. I think it's 16 characters that I will never remember. And so I've had to really change my own practices and start to use um, a proper service so I can actually manage my passwords and, and, and do that well. And that's just at a personal level, at a, at a corporate level, um, you really need to have dedicated focus. It needs to be on the agenda for frequent board meetings, you need to have the right guidance, you need to have appropriate budget, and you need to see it as an essential element in business going forward. And so it's, it's not easy, um, but we all have a growing recognition about the need for that. And unfortunately, there is some really great examples of collaboration and cooperation in, in across government and industry, et cetera, where intelligence is shared, um, understanding about emerging threats or current threats um, exist and, and having the right access to resources to really help combat that. And we've certainly, in Australia, had some really high profile organisations have debilitating impacts to their business as a result of, of hack, hacking and, and, and cyber activity, which really brings home the, the detrimental effects um, uh, an incident can have on your business, you know, and, and so we unfortunately are probably likely to see more of that because not everybody understands where their weaknesses are. So from a BPAY point of view, we are absolutely religious about our core practices and sometimes it's the fundamentals that serve you best. Frequent patching of your computer systems, frequent testing to understand where your weaknesses are, education of staff and in fact the biggest risk any organisations suffer is actually the people because they're not aware of the consequences of, of the, the most trivial things that can happen because you basically open the door a crack and opportunists can get into a system and just play havoc. And so really, we take it very seriously and fortunately haven't had any serious uh, incidents to speak of to date, but but I take no great comfort from that because we need to be absolutely vigilant. And, um, and so I, I just say that to any executive, make it your business to understand. Yes, there can be a lot of jargon, but there's jargon in every industry. So find out questions, speak to your CIO or, or speak to the security person in your organisation or speak amongst your professional networks, but take an interest understand more and ask questions in your own organization as to whether you're doing enough. Yeah, all great advice, Angela. And clearly um, there's this unfortunate trade-off. It's always been there between customer convenience and security. And the more convenient it is, it seems the less secure it is and the more secure it is, the less convenient it is. So we're always walking that fine line. Yeah, and there's a real tension, I think too, particularly in banking and finance, People want frictionless experiences, <laughs> but that can be 
really at odds with a secure experience. And that's the challenge for us all, which is actually finding that balance and also educating our, our customer base as to what we do and why. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that... Yeah, for sure. I can't believe the time's flying so quickly. It's such a fascinating discussion. I want to end this question, this discussion with a question I ask a lot of women and especially amazing senior leaders like you, Angela, um, is would you be able or willing to share some of the career advice that you might offer to your 30 year old self? Uh, if you were winding back your career just a short while to that stage, what would you want yourself to know? How would you perhaps navigate your career differently? I've been really fortunate in my career. I've had some wonderful opportunities and, and I, I feel very grateful for those. But I think I possibly could have made more of those if I'd sought more guidance and advice from some more experienced hands that would have perhaps given me a bit of a steer and I, it might have given me more confidence to, to tackle some of those situations that um, I, I was grappling with. I'd, I'd say back yourself. And I think women can often have that little sort of voice of doubt in the back of their heads, which, um, which can be quite, it can be a bit of a limiter. And particularly if you work in an environment which is dominated by um, alpha males, <laughs> It can be quite challenging at times to hold your ground and to um, ask for the opportunities or the assistance that you think you need. Um, so I'd say more guidance, back yourself and have the confidence, but definitely seize the opportunities. I'm, I'm glad of the opportunities that I see. So I've had ups and downs in my career like everybody has, but I'm really, I have no regrets about any of it because Every, every fork in the road created the opportunity and the environment for me to think about what's next. And so and in every case, I've, I've been happy with how my life has taken a turn. So, but and the other thing I'd say is keep educating yourself because armed with knowledge, it can actually give you confidence. And that education might just be, you know, reading articles. It might be doing a short course. It might be going to a conference. But every little bit of information you gather or every, every relationship that you cultivate, it gives you confidence about the subject area or, or might create a spark of interest in, in, in going in a different direction or tackling a project that you might not have considered before. And um, yeah. Those are great, things. great tips. I love the themes in confidence, which is so prevalent among women. We often lack or um, are challenged by having enough confidence to do things that we certainly have the capability, the competence to do. Um, and I think you're right, mentorship is, is important and we can all use them at all stages of our career. I was speaking to a senior woman the other day who said she'd be happy to mentor, um, but would be like lovely to have a mentor as well. So I have to keep in the back of my mind. Um, see if I can find her a mentor. Angela, this has been a fantastic discussion. I've learned so much about BPAY, about security, about consumer data rights and open banking and your amazing journey with um, growing BPAY over 23 years to be a really integral part of the payments infrastructure in Australia. And I'm sure you're going to take it beyond. <laughs> well, we've got ambitions, Christy. So, you know, we, we don't like to stand still. So as we speak, BPAY is um, investigating some other strategic opportunities. And we also work in an environment where it, it, it continues to change. And um, we're really excited. I mean, I, I, I absolutely love working at BPAY. It's a great place to work, but we also feel very privileged that um, in the Australian environment, we do have a, a very strong culture of innovation. I work for a great company that is really committed to that. And um, we hope that we will be able to talk about some of our other innovations the next time we get to speak. I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.